This is Real Estate Rookie episode 283. Yeah, so today we're at 28 units. We've got three deals across Texas. We've got a 10 unit in McAllen, an eight unit in Laredo, and a 10 unit in Houston. Well, first of all, we love just more units. I mean, it's just more scalable, so we can just keep that momentum going. But also, I feel like there's a lot of opportunity in that mid-sized multifamily range or, or smaller, whatever you want to call it, because a lot of them are just self-managing. So if we can get a good manager, a good operator, and we throw them in there, and we do a little bit of renovations, we pick up, we pick it up the ship, so it's actually moving. My name is Ashley Kerr, and I am here with my co-host, Tony Robinson. And welcome to the Real Estate Rookie Podcast, where every week, twice a week, we bring you the inspiration, motivation, and stories you need to hear to kickstart your investing journey. And as always, guys, we've got an amazing episode for you today. We've got Caleb and Charles. Um, they're a slightly younger duo that's been crushing it in the small multifamily space. Um, I think they're up to 28 units as of this recording. And in today's episode, we break down how basically they had like a six month ultimatum uh, from their families about whether or not they were actually going to be real estate investors. And they parlayed that into a successful real estate business. Yeah, one of my uh, favorite things about this episode, and we're actually going to have another episode in a couple of weeks that we recorded today too, is talking about how many phone calls they made. And the other episode we do talks about how many handwritten letters somebody did to get their first deal. So if you are struggling to get that first deal, listen through this episode just for some motivation and inspiration and how long it took them to actually get that first deal done after continuously making these calls and also how they transitioned from not just call calling the owners. They stopped calling owners that became to be too frustrating for them. So listen through to see who they call um, to actually get these deals done. Yeah, I think the other thing to to call out is how they were able to negotiate seller financing on this 10 unit at a ridiculous deal. And it really came down to understanding one thing about the seller. So make sure you listen for that part as well. Tony, do you have a review for us? I just want to hear how wonderful and beautiful and amazing you are. <laughs> Absolutely. So this uh, review comes from W. Blake C. And Blake says, I loved your episode about sober living homes. Bigger Pockets motivated us to open our first house here in Virginia. Grand opening is in August, and we we're planning on implementing the Burr and opening a woman's house down the road. Love Bigger Pockets. So, uh, if you guys didn't listen, that episode was with Devana uh, Reed, and her and her husband shared how they built a uh, pretty sizable portfolio of sober living homes. I don't recall the episode number. If you go back a few episodes, I'm sure you'll you'll find it. And the reception to that episode has been fantastic. So I'm I'm glad someone got some value from that. But if you guys are listening, all of our rookies listening, if you haven't yet left us a review on Apple Podcasts or whatever platform it is you're listening, please take a few minutes and do that. The more reviews we get, the more folks we can reach. And the more folks we reach, the more folks we can help and impact on their journey to financial freedom. And I should mention that today's episode, Tony is in Mexico, where it is wonderful and beautiful. And he has turned his camera several times to show me his view while I'm sitting here in Buffalo, where it's been snowing and raining all day here in April. So, <laughs> you know, this is this is actually the first time I've, I've recorded two entire podcast episodes in my swimming trunks. So this is like this is like the the best thing ever. So I got to come to Mexico more often. Usually Tony's in his black shirt and then his underwear. So, yeah, this is a big change for him. <laughs> <laughs> this, this is a big change for all of us. Well, Chuck, do you want to start telling us a little bit about yourself and how you got into real estate? Yeah, so we kind of got into real estate together. It was just rich dad, poor dad. Um, my mom gave it to me. What was it junior high school? And then I couldn't really act on it because I'm 16 years old. But yeah, I just kept reading books and then eventually got into contact with my mentor. Yeah, it was kind of, I'll piggyback off that a little bit. It was kind of a whole perfect storm that came together. It was kind of junior year, the COVID thing hit the world. That's when we were still in high school. And it was like, what do we do? It's like, we're bored out of our mind. None of our friends can leave our house. Luckily, we lived pretty much right next to each other. So Chuck's mom's like, oh, I heard of this good book. And then Rich Dad, Poor Dad, he gave it to me. And then kind of, we just started going down this path together. So you guys get this like real estate or, or financial freedom bug pretty early. But like you said, you can't do much as a 17 year old uh, in high school. So kind of fast forward to the point where you guys are actually at a point where you can start taking action on what you learned. Yeah, it kind of went by pretty quick. It was like, so went through our senior year of high school, a little more normalcy. And then we're both in junior college. I'm still playing baseball at the time. Chuck's just going to school. And I think we, I can speak for both of us when it's kind of like, gosh, this just isn't where we want to end up. So that's kind of when we started getting back into everything and kind of branching out, looking for 
where to start now that we were actually legally aged. So we just started networking and then we eventually just found our mentor. We cycled through a couple different people and we didn't really get anywhere. And then we eventually found Cody and he kind of just guided us on what exactly what to do. So what did you do? Yeah, um, when that whole thing started, I met Cody very early on. This was before he was even on um, Bigger Pockets, and just got referred to him through a local loan broker down here in San Diego and just was bugging him with questions, like as many as you could do in a day, just constantly hounding him. He's like, hey, I'm actually starting up a mentorship program right now if you'd be interested. And me, not having the money for the monthly fee, I call Chuck and I'm like, hey, you want to go into all this thing together? And then that's kind of how we got started with that. And and what strategy did you guys end up landing on? Because there's so many different ways to get started in the world of real estate investing. So what was the path you chose? And help us understand why you felt that was the best room for the two of you. Uh, we went we went with creative financing because number one, we're young, so we can't get like regular traditional financing, and we just didn't have any money. So like it was kind of like the only option, unless we we're going to partner on some big syndication or something like that. And we didn't really find see that as our path. Yeah, it was like being young, broke, no credit, none of that stuff. And it's like, gosh, how do we do this? And it really lucked out having Cody and Christian as our mentors because that's exactly the path they had went down. So they, there was a great blueprint already in place. And we're like, uh, well, we don't have any money. You had a little bit more money than us, but you still did it. <laughs> Let's see if this works. And kind of started stumbling our way down it. Can we, can we talk a little bit or just clarify for folks? Because the phrase creative finance encompasses a, a few different strategies and techniques. So when you all say creative finance, what exactly does that mean? Break it down for the audience. Yeah, um, with creative financing, basically we did. All three of our deals have been seller financed. We haven't delved into any of the wraps or sub two. One thing Cody and Christian really instilled in us was just keep it as simple as possible. And seller financing is how we found to do that. I just want to mention real quick that Cody that you're talking about, he was on episode 554 of the Bigger Pockets Real Estate Podcast. If anyone wants to go back after this episode and, and take a listen to it. So if you guys can, let, let's break down what seller finance means and, and why is that called creative financing versus traditional financing? Yeah. So uh, all it is is just the seller is acting as your bank. Instead of going to the bank, getting a loan, the seller is actually just going to lend you the money. Yeah, and that's great for people getting started because bank, you have all this underwriting, you have to meet all these qualifications, seller financing, there's just none of that. It's all made up or brainstormed by you and agreed to with the seller. So let's talk about that first deal. Um, what were you guys doing to source the deal? Yeah, so it was 100% just on market stuff. We were just calling like pretty much every broker in Texas. We didn't even really have like a real buy box or anything. We we're just like, okay, we're just going to volume this out and we're just going to call everybody, look at every single deal and see if we can make something happen. Yeah, there were a lot of calls between zero and number one. So was this when you guys were still in high school at this point in time? Or where? what were you guys doing at this point of time in your lives? Yeah, at this point, so we had gone through um, junior college. We met Cody and then Cody, joining Cody gave us the confidence to drop out of school. And so Chuck told his parents, I actually didn't tell my parents. I just stopped going to baseball practice and stopped going to school. And then <laughs> kind of from there, just kept following what Cody was preaching. And then that was around winter of 2021 until like spring of 2022 is when this whole thing was really going on. So were you leaving the house to go to college classes? Or? Um, that's actually how my parents found out is I just wasn't going to class or baseball anymore. They're just kind of like, my dad took me out to breakfast one weekend. He's like, um, what's happening to school? And I'm like, I don't go anymore. <laughs> Didn't appreciate that very much. And that's when we got set our timeline, or at least myself, I had six months or I had to get out of the house. So that was what your parents set for you. Yeah, it was just, you got to figure out the deal or got to go find somewhere else to stay. Can can we just pause for a second on that? Because I, I think kudos to your parents for not uh, overreacting and, and saying, you know, Hey, you, you better go back to school or else, but to kind of give you the the grace to, to give you the time to try and figure that out on your own. It, it kind of gave you permission to go all in on this. And I'm sure it probably motivated you because who wants to be homeless as a recently graduated, uh, high school kid. Right. So what, what were the steps that kind of flowed from that? Yeah, no, exactly. It's nobody, nobody wants to be homeless at 19 years old. So that it was nice. They gave me the grace. Um, kind of when I talked to them about it, how the six months kind of came about is I was like, well, look, if this is my dream and I want to chase it, the worst place, worst case scenario that happens is I'm back here in six months in the fall semester for college. It's like, it's just an extra six months to go try to chase this. So with doing your DoorDash, did you ever like come across any properties? Like maybe you're delivering at one house and you see the next door, the, the property is vacant. There's mail piled up at, outside. Did you kind of incorporate any driving for dollars? Uh, not really, because we uh, we weren't really looking to buy in our backyard of San Diego. Just it's 
tough to break into that market if you have no money and just not a ton of connections. So we just kind of were focusing on our Texas deals. Yeah. One thing we were doing, though, is when we were doing DoorDash and driving, at least for me, I always had like a real estate audiobook on. It was always just like trying to make the most of my time. But yeah, yeah, not much driving for dollars. San Diego. It, I mean, it's hard enough to start real estate with no money, let alone start in San Diego, California. And how did you guys choose your market then? Uh, So initially we were looking in uh, northern Nevada and like you're looking on just on market deals. I mean, there were only like a handful and we just wanted to volume it out. So we're like, OK, we need to go somewhere else that's pretty relatively close that we can go fly to but has a, a, enough deals where we can just call, call, call day in, day out. So we just went through Texas because it's, it's just a huge Yeah, market. it eventually, um, piggybacking off what Chuck said, it eventually came down to, well, we're either going to do Texas or Florida. And kind of the logic was Texas is halfway closer across the country than Florida. So we're going to try here first and see what happens. How many, you mentioned that there were a lot of phone calls. Uh, roughly how many people did you have to call in Texas before you actually got a deal that turned into something? Yeah, that's a great question. Um. Gosh, amount of brokers, it was probably around 500 to 1,000 phone calls, somewhere in there. Can we break down? So you, you mentioned that you had a, a script. What what exactly were you saying when people picked up the phone to pitch them on the seller finance? Was it the first thing that came out of your mouth? Like, hey, will you sell a finance this deal? And it's like a quick yes or no, or were you trying to understand their situation, their motivation? What, what did that conversation typically flow like? Yeah, so I was um, doing the majority of the calls, and they were mainly to brokers. Just we had we'd had a bad luck with owners. We tried them a little bit, but it was kind of got shut down pretty quick. So we're like, gosh. And we actually went out to Texas to meet with an owner, had five meetings scheduled, four of them canceled. So we're kind of like, yeah, this isn't going to make much sense when we're saving every penny like to have for this and then get kind of screwed over last second. So what we ended up doing, it was just calling brokers. And the first thing was just making sure the deal was still available, just because if it's not, it's like it's a waste of five minutes of their time and my time. And then we knew like which areas in Texas we liked. We'd look up population growth to obviously see how the area is. But neighborhood to neighborhood, we weren't too sure. So I wanted to go find out about that, find out the neighborhood in the area. And then kind of after that is when we'd bring up the seller financing. You know, how long have they owned it? What's their motivation here for selling? And then if it's like older looking to retire, we're like, would they would they be open to a seller finance? And most of the time it was no, but eventually we landed on a few yeses. Can you talk about some of the advantages for the seller to do seller financing? And do you ever work that into your pitch? Um, so that's not really a big focus of ours because we're just talking straight to the brokers or the brokers communicating with the seller. Um, but a couple of like of the advantages I've seen is like if you're passing it on to your children, uh, it's a lot easier to just pass on a note than a building. I mean, a lot of a lot of these people are self-managing it. They don't want to just throw it all on their kids um, to, to actually manage the building. Yeah, and then piggyback in there as well. I think a huge advantage is being able to give the price that they might be looking for. Sometimes with conventional financing, currently the building just isn't worth X, but seller financing, you're like, okay, I know it's worth blank day one. And I know I can get the rents up to this, get the expenses down. So the building will be worth enough, but just day one, it's not. So there's a lot more room for creativity and getting sellers what they're looking for. We just uh, had Pace Morby on, on episode 280, where he talked about seller financing and that was kind of exactly one of the things that he had said, too, is that the purchase price is sometimes just what's important to the seller. And with doing seller financing, you're able to get there, too. Yeah, I think everybody's motivation is different. But a lot of these people, they just have a purchase price set in their mind, especially in the market today. It's like they just have that one purchase price they're looking for and they're not going to move off it. So with seller financing, sometimes that's the only way to get it done. One one question I want to go back to you guys is you talked about 500 to possibly 1,000 calls you had to make. O over what time frame was that? How long did it take for you guys to get those 1,000 calls before that first deal came through? Uh, it took about five months for us to get actually get a deal under contract. I mean, it's, it's just a long time of doing it day in and day out. Yeah. <laughs> so to go through that process, 1,000 calls, five months. A lot of people, I think, would have given up after 90 days of, of some even after like a week of just kind of banging your head against the wall. So what was the motivation for you? That's a lot of rejection. What was the motivation for you guys to keep pushing until you found that first yes? Yeah, I think one of the big ones is just knowing it was possible. Like if we hadn't met Cody or we doing this on our own, we're like, gosh, maybe this thing just isn't real. Like maybe you just can't do it. But having met Cody and Christian and seeing that they had actually done this and made it happen, it was like, okay, we know this is possible. It just, we got to figure out how to find the right deal. But that was a big one. And also it was just our dream. It was like, since we were 16 years old, we had been looking to buy real estate and we're like, we're not just going to give up now. We're going to ride this thing out. 
see if we can make something happen. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about your guys' partnership going into this. So you guys read Rich Dad, Poor Dad together. When did it become official that you guys were going to work together? Um, It was kind of just straight away. We just kind of hopped in it together and we were learning with each other. And it was kind of scary at first, like just like talking to anybody, especially like cold calling an owner or a broker. It's just like, and you're 18 years old and you have no idea what you're talking about it. So like... <laughs> Hopping in with him just helped me a lot. I'm sure it helped him a lot. Um, just have more confidence. And you guys have partnered on all your deals together, or have you done some that are separate? Well, we're partnered on all 28 units so far. Uh, just for for context sake, like how how are the two of you separating duties? Like Caleb, what do you do? Chuck, what do you do? And how do you all make sure that you're not stepping on each other's toes or kind of getting in the way of each other? Yeah, that's a great question. At the beginning, we were doing a lot of the calls. I was doing a lot of the calls, but Chuck was helping out with most of the underwriting duties. So it was like, I'd find the deal, be like, hey, got a deal, look at this, like send it over to him. Then we'd kind of get together, congregate on it, like, hey, this is what we're thinking. Could this work? Almost every time it was no. <laughs> but and now today, it's a lot more of, I'm kind of the one still doing the acquisitions and Chuck is handling most of the operations and kind of the back end stuff. And then do you guys have an agreement, like an operating agreement or a joint venture agreement or like a partnership charter? Like, have you all kind of sat down to outline what this partnership looks like or is it more of a handshake back the napkin type of relationship no and we have an operating agreement yes because we also have our capital partners so we got to make sure they're protected as well and we're all just fulfilling our duties as managers and, and them as members yeah let's get to your portfolio then what does it look like today you know are you holding properties and how many deals have you done yeah so today we're at 28 units we've got three deals across texas we've got a 10 unit in mcallen an eight unit in laredo and a 10 unit in houston what made you guys want to go after the small multifamily instead of doing single family or even duplexes to, to go ahead and jump in with something a little bit larger? Um, well, first of all, we love just more units. I mean, it's just more scalable so we can just keep that momentum going. But also, I feel like there's a lot of opportunity in that midsize multifamily range or, or small or whatever you want to call it, because a lot of them are just self-managing. So if we can get a good manager, a good operator, and we throw them in there and we do a little bit of renovations, we pick up, we pick it up the ship. So it's actually moving. We can actually increase the building a lot because they're so under rented. Like our first building, the rents were all at 600 easily can be at 800 with just a little bit of upgrades. With the, the multifamily, are you guys doing the operations then, the property management, the asset management, that piece of it? And what are you outsourcing, if any of that? Yeah, so um, being out of state, we have property managers for our properties down there, but we're overseeing the managers, kind of making sure the asset's going in the direction we want, handling the renovations, overseeing everything. Can we can we talk about how you guys chose and vetted that, uh, that management company? Because I think, for a lot of folks, they they underestimate how much goes into managing the property manager and choosing the wrong person can obviously derail your deal. So how did you guys choose the right property manager for your market? And how were you able to kind of hold them accountable? What does that relationship look like? Yeah. So when we're vetting the property managers, it was I had called one huge benefit of calling so many brokers in the state of Texas is I had called so many different people in so many different markets. So once we finally hit in those markets, it was like, hey, who's your PM here? Who's your go-to? Like, who's your favorite property manager? And then one name kept coming up. So we were like, called them. Just was like, hey, like, just talking to them. Wanted to see what their vision was for the property, if it aligned with ours, if we kind of had the same goals in mind with it. And then we did. And so we just decided to go with them. And then in terms of the ongoing relationship, because I know Ash and I will talk about this, where you see some PMs where the costs are kind of spiraling out of control and the you know day-to-day -day management things are slipping so how how do you all act as asset managers and kind of hold your property managers accountable yeah i think it's um a weird balance because right you have kind of being on them too much and you have being on them not enough so it's a constant struggle to find like that perfect balance so i think it just all depends on what's going on like if you're doing renovations like we're getting into now it's like you got to be on them a little more like hey how's it going what are we doing here like the progress of everything but it's just letting them do their job at the same time. It's like they're a property management company for a reason. So it's just the big thing is just finding a balance between being on them too much and then not being on them enough. If you guys could do it again, or maybe you did this in the beginning, but what are some questions that you can uh, give to our listeners that they can ask when interviewing a property management company? Yeah, I think a huge one uh, I don't know about you, but it's how many units they own in the area and like how long they've been doing it. It's because some of these fresh managers, like we've interviewed a few of them, just didn't really know what they were like doing. It was like 
they kind of sounded uncertain on the phone. And I'm like, well, if you're uncertain, there's no way you have like, if you're uncertain, I'm going to be uncertain about this. So it just didn't make sense. But yeah, just how long they've been doing it and how many units they have is a huge thing. And then I think market rent and then how they'd handle certain situations. Like how would you handle vacancies? How do you go about filling vacancies? What do you see as market rent here? The units are currently at this. Do you think we get to this? Like what would it take? So just kind of their understanding of the area and knowledge is huge if they're going to like manage your building the right way. I I do agree with you that I think there have been a lot of startup property managers the last several years of people just thinking that, you know, here's an opportunity. I've got a couple units myself. I might as well share the overhead. I can manage these units. Great. And then go on and it ends up not really working out that well. Or I've also seen where they do start and then they grow too fast where they don't have, you know, the processes and systems in place to, to kind of handle that many units. And that's where it, it kind of starts to hurt them. Yeah, no, I definitely agree. We have um, three managers because we're in three different cities in Texas. So the same process for all three is like each city we came across some people like got a recommendation. They were really fresh in the game. It's like had barely in our units under management, like not even in the area we were looking in that city. And it's like, oh, I think we're going to go a different direction here. So I 100% agree. It's about finding one that's established, has been in business and has a clear plan for your building. And what do you think about fees? Are you willing to pay a little bit more for the property management fee um, instead of going with somebody who's cheaper, even if they are more green? Yeah, this is something you can't skimp on. Property management is almost everything when you're going out of state investing. So you need to make sure you find the right one. And on the note of fees, I just also want to talk about like, uh, again, just just kind of what that relationship looks like. So when when your property management company is is solving problems on a day-to-day basis, at what point do you require that they communicate with you? Is there a dollar threshold? Is there a certain, I don't know, like impact level that you're looking for? Like, how do you kind of make sure that you, like, as you said, Caleb, that you're not over managing, but you're, you're not under managing either? Yeah, usually it's, um, if, unless it's like a little fix in the building, it's like, just go ahead and get it done. But if it's like an AC unit or something like that, of that nature, kind of on that level is when I'd like to start to be notified. Like, hey, this tenant's AC went out, we need to get a repair. Like, okay, let's get on that. But kind of at that level and up is probably when I'd like to be notified. Yeah, I know what I did when we had our, our long terms. We had a, a specific dollar amount in our property management agreement that said anything under this dollar amount, don't talk to me about it, handle it on your own. Anything above this dollar amount is is where I need to be involved to get the final say. And Ash, I think you have a, like a very similar thing in all of your property management agreements as well, right? Yeah, it's a, a dollar amount. And then the appliances, which has been a big issue for me. Do not ask me to replace an appliance, please just replace it. Like, what am I going to say? No, their fridge isn't working. Um, let me think about it for a couple of days and I'll get back to you. Like, no, don't even ask me, just take care of it. But, uh, I, I want to ask about the rehab process too, with using the property management company. You said that, you know, they kind of oversee it and you have to, you know, keep on top of them for that. What are their roles that they're doing for you during the rehab process? And then what are your responsibilities? Are you kind of designing the rehab? Are you the one hiring the contractors? Are the managers doing it? And what does that whole process look like? Yeah, the main thing so far has kind of been, they kind of hook us up with their contractors in the area that they've been in business with for a while. Then that contractor gets me a quote and they kind of oversee the work as that contractor goes about it. And it's all different. Like one of our PMs, the one in Houston is like, hey, we got this. Like they're asking for this on the floor. If we can get this done, we can get it rented out for X by the end of the month. It's like, okay, let's go ahead and do it. The other ones is kind of going more through the contractor because they don't have them in-house. So each one's different, but it's kind of just making sure we oversee it and that they stay on top of the contractors as well. And we work with great property managers. So they're really good at assessing like what we need and what we don't need. So, so usually it's pretty tight and we can get the best ROI for our money on the renovations. Yep. And then are they charging you like a project management fee on top of your regular management fee at all? Um, not so far. No, they've kind of just been, Hey, like our contractor's doing this. And then that's the company that outsources it. He's really close to them. And the other company just has it in house. So that's actually pretty solid, right? Cause a, a lot of property management companies, they make more revenue by upcharging things like repairs and maintenance and managing construction projects. In fact, they're giving it to you just kind of on the house, you know, it's a good property management company. No, it's awesome. Have great relationships with them. So I, I want to deep dive uh, one deal. So do y'all have maybe one deal in mind that we can talk through the numbers on? Okay, yeah. 
Yeah, well, our Houston Tenplex. Okay, let's talk about the Houston Tenplex. I'm going to shoot you some questions. Just give me some rapid fire questions. We'll we'll set the table. We'll go back and kind of uh, deep dive it from there. So first, what was the uh, the purchase price in this property? It was seven hundred and twenty five thousand. Seven twenty five, and you said this was a Tenplex. Yep. Man, that's awesome. You guys are crushing it. Um, and did you find this property on market, off market, uh, off market from a broker relationship I'd built. And then how did you fund this property? Uh, we just brought in an equity partner. So they, they own half the deal. We own half of the deal and we just split the cash flow. So first, before we even like go into the deal, what you just said, um, where you, you found the deal, uh, you kind of put the whole thing together and you brought in a partner to pretty much carry all of the financial, uh, like burden for the deal. And then you split everything 50, 50. I've done that countless times in our business and the majority of the properties in my portfolio today, we purchased without using any of our own capital, but it's because we found the deal. We did the work, we set it up, we managed it long-term. And there are so many people out there who have the capital, but don't have the time, desire, or ability to do it themselves. And they would happily partner with someone else who's willing to do those things for them just in exchange for a little bit of, uh, a little bit of cash. So uh, you guys are a great example of that. So uh, let, let's kind of take this deal from the beginning. So um, what about, I guess, just kind of give us the, the story, right? Walks through how you found it, how you found this partner, how you put the whole deal together. Yeah, it was just so, it was a broker relationship. I had called him on a deal in Houston like two months prior and just kind of stayed checking up every like three weeks or so. Like, hey, how's it going? You got anything coming in the line? No, no, no. And then he shoots me a text one day. Hey, 10 flex in Houston. Would you be interested? I'm like, of course. So start looking at the deal and it's like, holy cow, for the asking this guy once, this deal's bringing in like, what was it? Over eight grand. It was like, this thing is a cash cow. Like we knew a good deal and we saw one. We're like, okay, wanted to make sure he'd sell our finance like a hundred percent. And they, we got the confirmation on that. So after that, we started negotiating the terms like, Hey, what's most important to him? And it was the interest and the purchase price. And then, yeah, just kind of went under contract from there. What did you guys end up doing for the terms? What was the amortization period and the interest rate? Uh, so it was interest only. It was 5.25% and it was 10% down. Okay. And then how long was it interest only for? Did you have like a balloon payment or how did that work? Yeah. So it's um, we have a balloon in three years. But the only reason we were okay to compromise on that balloon time is the deal. We bought it so under market value. It's like realistically, we could go refinance right now if we wanted to. So we were comfortable shorting the balloon on that. And then, yeah, I owe for all three years. I did a seller financing with interest only and did a balloon for a year and I was sweating, man. It was the same day, closed on it. And then I um, did it. I mailed the check overnight to the, um, to the, the guy that did the seller financing and, uh, he didn't get it. And I was just like, Oh my God. And I was in like sheer panic and, he thought it was going to be hand delivered to his house, but he lived in some like development where they have mailboxes at like the beginning of the de development and the postmaster from that town, I, I called her, I was like, I don't know what to do. And she actually drove out there and was like, um, it was in his mailbox. He thought it was going to be delivered to his door. I mean, that was like hours of pure panic and pain that I felt. So that, that's good that you guys... Give, yeah, give you guys a, a good cushion for three years compared to, to one year. But I think that's a great example of looking at the different variables. Like you guys bought so below under market that you're not worried about when you do have to refinance that it's going to appraise enough so that you're able to pull all your money back out and pay off that seller financing. Exactly. I was just going to ask, what is the, what does the rehab look like? Like, was this a turnkey property? Did you have to put in capital to get this rent ready and, and increase the value? Yeah. So day one, they were rent ready, but they aren't up to market standard on the units. Like they're already achieving, like we're making 15% cash on cash on the deal day one. It's like, we love it, but there's still an extra $200 upside per rent or per unit in rent. So it's like, we just go in whenever they leave the lease, we just go in, renovate it, get an extra 200 to 250 on the rent. And what's the potential or projected cost per unit to get them, you know, that additional $200 in, in uh, rent? Uh, it's just usually about three grand. It's super simple, uh, Reno. It's that one company we were talking about before. Um, yeah, they have in-house contractors yeah. just handle everything. Like, hey, this person's leaving. Let's go ahead and get this done. They give me over the quote. It's like, okay, let's get it going. What was one lesson that you guys learned on this deal? I think the biggest one is everybody's motivation's different. Like with sellers, like some sellers are just like, hey, I need this price, blah, blah, blah. Like, or they want a large down payment. Or they want a lot of interest. This guy was like, hey, I just don't want to manage it anymore. Like, can we please just like come to an agreement? Like he was, he wanted to keep it off market. He didn't want his tenants knowing he was selling the building because he had built such a great relationship with his tenants 
that he didn't want to let them know and damage that relationship and have them all leave. So it was completely off market. They didn't know. And a big motivation for him was not upsetting those tenants either. We talk a lot about estoppel agreements and sending those out to tenants before you take over to kind of verify the lease information, or especially if there isn't a lease with what the the property owner is saying. Were you guys able to do those or were you not able to since the owner didn't want the tenants knowing they were going to sell? Um, we did something else. I think, what is it called? An affidavit or something along those lines. I can't remember exactly what it's called, but it's basically he signs off on it himself. And if it, they were to be incorrect, then we can uh, go after him legally. But yeah, they all ended up being correct. Since we closed, got them all verified with our management company and everything's been going smooth. That's awesome. Well, congratulations, guys. That's really cool. Appreciate it. Just one last thought on my side. I'm so glad that, that you brought that up, Caleb, is that every seller has a different motivation. And we can't always assume that we know what's going to motivate someone to sell a property. And for some people, it could be time. They want to close quickly. Uh, for some people, it could be price. They just want the highest overall price. Some people, it could be cash in pocket today. They want the biggest down payment. Others, it could be interest. It could be an infinite number of things. And for your seller, interestingly enough, they were most concerned with making sure that they maintain that relationship with their tenants. And as long as you're able to solve that problem, now you're in a position where it's a win-win situation. And I'll never forget, I, Ash and I interviewed someone, it was quite some time ago, I can't remember which episode, but they ended up getting a really great deal on a single family house. And all they had to do was pay for a moving company to help this old lady move. Like in her mind, the biggest reason or the biggest obstacle to her moving was packing up all of her stuff. And this person was like, well, ma'am, if I just get you a moving company and help you move to your next place, like, would that help? And she was like, oh my gosh, that would help so much. And would you really do that for me? And it's like, as long as you're listening, you can identify what those challenges are. And if you can solve that, you you get a great deal. Yeah, couldn't agree more. One thing that's difficult more going through brokers is you don't always know what that motivation is. It's because sometimes broke all the brokers aren't the best at conveying what the seller really wants. So once you find that key, what they're really looking for, that's when negotiations really take off. So that's a great point. If I can ask one follow-up question. So a lot of times agents aren't super excited about seller financing because in some of those situations, their permissions can get cut or, or things like that. So how did you still incentivize the agents to actually present this deal to you? Yeah, I think I had let him know what I was looking for, seller financing over time. Like, hey, this is what I'm looking for, seller financing, Houston 5 to 25, like made it very clear. And for him, there was no stress. Just I made it clear like, hey, we're still going to get you commission. That's not getting me issue. And when he was confident that we weren't going to cut the commission or anything like that, it was just a normal deal for him. Okay. Well, you guys, thank you so much for sharing that deal. I'm going to take us into our rookie exam. Uh, so we'll give you guys each a, a question here. Um, first, Chuck, let's start with you. What is one actionable thing rookies should do after listening to this episode? I would say just hop straight in uh, because that's how we basically learned everything. Christian and Cody gave us a little bit of information, a little bit of direction, and then we just go heavily apply it. Just apply it, apply it, apply it. And that's how we just did all of our learning. And that's how you really get started. Even if you don't know everything, uh, day one. All right, Caleb, next question is for you. What's one software app or system that you use in your business? Nothing too complicated, honestly. Just make sure you're keeping track of everything. For me, I use Excel spreadsheets. It's like you want to keep it as simple as possible, but just make sure you're keeping track of things. Like even if it's just broker calls, like you aren't like if you're calling a thousand people, you're not remembering every single call from three months ago. So it's just staying on top of it, whether it be Google Sheets, Excel, notes in your phone, whatever. But just make sure you're staying on top of what you're doing. Okay. And then this question is for both of you. Where do you plan on being in five years? Chuck, you want to go first? Here, at least one goal. I want to at least have one building paid off in the uh, in five years. So that's something I, I 100% want to do. Probably that 10 plex, pay that thing off. That's uh, That's where I see myself in five years. Yeah, I think I agree with that 100%. I'd love to pay that building off. And it's also just keep scaling up and buying good seller finance deals. So, I mean, seller financing, it's not everybody's open to it, but it's just the easiest way to get a deal done. It's the simplest, works for both sides. It's more of a win-win in most scenarios. So just at least 150 units by then, bare minimum. Love that. Those are some amazing goals, guys. And the the pace that you're moving at, I have every reason to believe you guys will, you guys will hit that number. So kudos to you both. Uh, cool. So before we start to wrap things out here, I want to give a shout out to this week's Ricky Rockstar. Uh, and this week's Ricky Rockstar's name is Derek. Gokul, and hopefully I got the, the name uh, correct there, but Derek said, my goal was to purchase my first investment property within a year and a half of graduating high school, and I did it. 
being 19 years old, I gained a few or saw a few negative reactions to people who didn't think I could do it, but hard work, drive, and a strong support system can help you achieve anything. So Derek, uh, congratulations to you for being 19 years old and getting that first deal done. Well, Chuck and Caleb, can you guys let everyone know where they can find out some more information about you and reach out to you? Uh, Instagram's the best if you want to reach out, uh, Chucky underscore Sotelo. And then I'm Caleb.Hommel. And we also have a YouTube channel. It's Caleb and Chuck. Well, awesome. Thank you guys so much for taking the time to come on today and share so much value with us and the listeners. Thank you. Yeah, you guys are great. That was fun. That was awesome. What a great episode with Caleb and Chuck. What a like uh, inspirational seller financing story as to <laughs> here they are. They have no money. They're door dashing just to learn about real estate to, to pay for some mentors. And then here they are now. They have three big deals locked up with seller financing. One of the things that I think Caleb said this that really stood out to me was he talked about his buy box and how the fact that he was so specific when he reached out to these brokers is what eventually led to one of them sending him that 10 unit deal that they closed on. And he said, you know, we told every broker that we spoke with that we're looking for between five to 25 units, specifically sellers that are willing to sell or finance in this area of Texas. And when you're that specific with an, an agent or a broker, when something matches that, you know, they, they have every reason to want to reach out to you. Um, and then the second thing that Caleb said was that he was able to still incentivize the brokers to send him deals because he made sure to reassure them that he was still going to give them their commissions as if it were a, a regular transaction. Yeah. And they talked too about their partnership, how that kind of formed. And it was definitely over time. It wasn't just they met one day and they decided to partner. So I think that's kind of an interesting story as to how they've grown their partnership and, and work together today and who's and also how their roles and responsibilities have also changed. Um, so Tony, uh, let's do a social media shout out to Sarah today because Tony's wife, Sarah recently changed her Instagram handle from Sarah rad to Sarah rad Robinson, right? Can you spell it out for me? (laughs) (laughs) She did. So S A R A R A D Robinson. So Sarah rad Robinson, she made it official. And it's because like the, the whole like meta verify thing, you can't change your username afterwards. So she was like, am I going to be Sarah Rad forever? Should I, you know, be a Robinson? I was like, I didn't marry you for you not to change your last name on Instagram. So you got to, you got to add the Robinson in there. So, but it did take her a long time to change your name. Cause I remember when she did change her handle, I was like, but did you actually change your name to that? <laughs> but Sarah puts out a lot of great content, but um, unlike Tony, it's not just great content. There's also very funny reels that she posts that are real estate related. So you should give her a follow. Yeah. And actually Sarah posted yesterday. Yeah, and I don't know if I shared this on the podcast yet, but Sarah is uh, officially four months pregnant right now. So uh, she posted on her Instagram yesterday and we kind of shared it with the world. So um, come October, baby Robinson will, will be here. Yes. And so excited for both of you. Um I, I'm really excited for a little tiny baby co-host <laughs> to be a part of this podcast. So guys, if you haven't already, go uh, wish Tony and Sarah congratulations on their Instagram account. And maybe we'll get some baby love time here on the, the podcast episode a couple of times. So. <laughs> thank you. Appreciate it. Okay. Well, thank you guys so much for joining us. I'm Ashley at Wealth From Rentals and he's Tony at Tony J. Robinson. And we will see you guys on Saturday for a Rookie Reply. Still-